It's a pleasure for me to moderate such a thought-provoking and inspiring panel. And uh, I would only ask uh, all the presenters and uh, commentators to preserve time limit in 20 minutes, if it's possible, of course. And it's my pleasure to invite our first presenter, Dr. Karina Jarzinska, a research assistant in the Center for Anthropology of Literature and Culture Studies at the Polish Studies Department, Jagiellonian University. In 2015, she defended her PhD thesis in lit literature studies entitled Literature as a Spiritual Exercise, the Work of Czesław Miłosz from the Post-Secular Perspective. She's a member of several research teams working on such projects as, for instance, unmemorialized genocide sites and their impact on collective memory, cultural identity, ethical attitudes, and intercultural relations in contemporary Poland. So, please, Karina. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I'm working in this project that was just mentioned. I won't read the whole long title again. Uh, you may just look at it. Uh, the head of the project, Professor Ramazan Deka, um, assumed while um, initiating it that such sites play unmemorialized genocide sites play a vital role in the processes of identity formation and in fashioning attitudes towards, attitudes towards the past, being only apparently removed from social and cultural circulation. For this reason, she called them non-sites of memory. That's uh, her coin, the term coined by, by her. Our interdisciplinary team investiga investigated eight sites here you have the map um, with all of them marked uh, in two colors. <laughs> the, the red uh, sites are those uh, poza obozie, places very near the, to the death camps. So we investigated eight sites where different kinds of violence has been pe performed during the Second World War or right after it. I don't have time to go into details of the criteria of our choices. My specific role in the project is to interpret the way religion is present in such sites and in the discourses, objects, and practices created in relation to them. I am still at the beginning uh, of this process and I am very happy uh, for the opportunity to share my initial findings with you and I hope for your feedback. I am going to briefly present three of the sites in question, uh, Radecznica, Bożencin, and Hodówki. Well, in the other uh, way round, like Radecznica, Hodówki, and Bożencin. I changed the previously, uh, um, previous uh, order. So I'll start, start with Radecznica. Mm, but I have some other introductory remarks for you, just I'll try to be brief. So all of them bear witness to Nazi genocide of the Jews or and Romani people, uh, sometimes both. And they are all in the process of transition from being a non-site of memory uh, to a site of memory. Although only some of the material I'm about to show you is vernacular, the locals are probably the most important actors of the ongoing commemoration, both as the contesters and cultivators of the difficult heritage they happen to live with. Neither Jewish nor Roma communities are now living in the neighborhood, yet their representatives are involved in the process. I am interested in how the complex of an ambivalent relation between people and places echoes in artifacts and actions situated or performed there, along with the inevitable negotiations of the parties involved, representing often various religious backgrounds. So, uh, Radecznica. Uh, I start every case I present with the photo of the site, the, the main site we think uh, meets the criteria of an on-site of memory. And here uh, you see um, a ravine where around a dozen Jews were murdered, murdered in 1942. The person visible at the back is Marianna Zebała, 
the wife of recently deceased Stanisław Zybała. Stanisław, born in 1930 in Radecznica, was a Holocaust witness, a librarian, collector, and memory activist who authored many publications and artistic objects. Marianna accompanied him in those ventures and now continues his work as an adopted witness, as we call her. She was born in another village, but also before the war. The couple co-authored uh, this brochure, the book, entitled uh, How I See You, Radecznica, on the path, roads, bulks, through bushes and breaks. Mm, so they are uh, stated at the cover as co-authors, but soon as we open the book, we find out that Stanisław was the leader of creative process, as the book begins with the recount of his oniric vision of, uh, and I quote, I will quote a lot of specific, uh, very vernacular language of Stanisław Zybała, he was a very uh, creative, uh, writer and speaker. So uh, he had this oniric vision of a certain glorious lady who asked him to mark the sites where I quote, nobody ever sang Salve Regina, nor recited Kaddish. Zibawa comments that the task was difficult, but iron strongly motivated. And the lady radiated him with the power to accomplish it. This rhetorical opening seems to be an indirect statement about religious character of the impulse that had driven Zibawa's work of commemorating genocide victims. As Professor Agajanian noticed uh, on the first, time of our, first day of our conference, uh, witnessing the innocent suffering is a traumatic experience that may result in the engagement in the process of meaning building using the religious actions, language reflections to diminish the semantic hole produced by anthropogenic disasters of 20th century, and these are more or less uh, exact citations from the um, keynote lecture we, we heard. I find it quite uh, adequate to, to this case. On the next 50 pages of Zibawa's publication, composed of a symmetric mixture of photos and text, every page of the book looks quite more or less like this, uh, and uh, Zibawa calls it photoskrybanie in Polish, like photo scrivening, something like this. We are guided through the necrotopography of Radecznica, yet not only Jewish, Catholic, and Orthodox gravesites and cemeteries are mentions, mentioned, but every religion or memory related object. To accomplish his mission, uh, Zibawa wraps seven non kadish graves, non kadyshowe grody, bez kadyshowe groby, how he calls them, in the many more sacred spaces already familiar to his readers. The key importance of Holocaust-related sites uh, is indicated by the author's encouragement for Radecznic, the, the local inhabitants, to stop there and say a specific prayer. And there are three uh, sites where he proposes a specific prayer prayer each time the other one. Here you, you, uh, you see the El Melerahamim, Malerahamim, excuse me. Uh, but at the other side he proposes to, to pray, to, to recite uh, the Itzkor play, prayer and Kaddish, Kaddish de Rabbanan. As we know from Marianna Zibawa, it has been a custom that the couple have developed over the years, which started with Catholic prayers, gradually substituted by the uh, Jewish ones as they learned them. Mm. So they had those walks to the non-sites of memory and recited Kaddish and so on. Still, according to Halaha, such rituals lacks the pr pragmatic efficiency at least in the case of its current Kaddish, which re requires the presence of a minion to be like, effective. Uh, Zebawa's proposition seems as a more secular than religious practice. We could label it as a cultural, cultural maybe, 
as they seem to present their fellow citizens the richness and the beauty of the Jewish tradition. Still, there is a sacred dimension uh, to it that complicates the picture. Apart from the sacred status conferred upon the, his mission by the figure that can be interpreted as a Holy Mary, Zbawa gives two other rhetorical arguments for his assumed cohabitants of Radecznica to perform the ritual he proposes. Firstly, he recommends to start the journey in the haunted spot by the old wooden cross near the river. He vividly depicts uh, the scary specters that attack lonely wanderers who, who go there and horrify them so much that they won't even walk that way again. It is like blackmailing his readers, implying that if they won't cooperate as a community and pay respect to the dead, they won't be able to safely live the, at the area. Another argument is uh, given towards the end of the book um, in the form of devotional image of resurrected Christ that suddenly appears among the photos of Fradershnica with the caption, uh, after all, he was one of them. The, proje the projected reader of this message is a Christian who needs to be convinced that sanctifying the Jewish remnants may be his own obligation. That's my interpretation of this image, at least. While Zebawa actively shaped the mnemoscape of Radecznica as a whole, he made an ex exceptional effort to commemorate one specific place, and this is this uh, ravine I showed you at the beginning. This is a place when, where his school friend, Rajla, uh, has been hiding with his fa her family and has been murdered in December 1942. Zabawa heard the execution and then saw the traces of fresh burial, so he knew exactly where her body was buried. After the war, he marked the place with three symbols. The first of them is a cross based on a um, natural fracture in the tree trunk, like he only did the horizontal line on the tree to, to, to create a cross. Mm, the second, also a cross, is signed Rajli for, for Rajla. It's hardly visible on the other image, but it's there. According to Marianna, her husband still felt uh, this was not appropriate enough for, uh, and he carved a Magan David uh, on the third trunk. And it is there. Please note the mistake uh, in the way the star is shaped. Its arms are not intersecting, as the traditional symbol uh, should look like. This idiosyncratic design is repeated on the Zebawa's map of Radecznica, the map with unmemorialized sites of the Holocaust that he sent to the various Jewish institutions. This is this uh, star at, at the top. In 2016, two years after Stanislav Zebawa's death, a proper grave has been ritually established by the rabbi Michael Schuldrich over the Rajla's body. As you can see, the marble gravestone is marked with the same symbol created by her childhood friend. The rabbinical commission of the Jewish cemeteries in Poland apparently decided to speak vernacular language uh, to reach the local audience, even for the price of compromising religious tradition, as they are aware that it, mo it is mostly up to the people of Radecznica to keep the memory of the site. Um, I just wanted to briefly show you some other uh, efforts of Stanislav Zybawa to create this uh, Judeo-Christian commemorative language uh, I think he was in the search of. With the wood um, collected in the ravine, he carved a six-branched branches menorah Establishing, establishing an indexual reference between the sculpture and the Holocaust remembrance. You know, the, this exact wood we are looking at was taken from the ravine. According to Marianna, this menorca, as they uh, called it, has been put on the family table every Christmas. Uh, he also made a sculpture of Rajla, and please note at the bottom of the sculpture there, are, there is this te tetragrammaton, uh, the name of a god in Jewish uh, Hebrew, Hebrew letters. It's a, a strange 
awkward way of marking her Jewish, Jewishness. And there is this matseva-shaped cemetery symbol of Radecznica, framed with the po Polish emblem of an eagle, uh, which is another long, fascinating story I won't be talking about now. I just wanted to conclude saying that Zybała himself was not a devotee of any religious tradition. Uh, he was brought up as a Catholic, but he ceased going to church uh, just after the war, according to Marianna's claims. He donated his body to science and didn't want a cross on his grave. I would say religiosity of the librarian from Radecznica seems to be a personal, complex, eclectic, bystander experienced, driven endeavor. Um, he may be called a religious bricoleur of post-traumatic mnemoscape. Uh, that's it about Stanislav Zybała for now. And a uh, quick view into Hodówki. Okay. Yeah, the other cases are uh, just briefly presented, what will be briefly presented. And here is the other photo. It's a uh, wood of Hodówki, as the locals call it, this, the, the place. It's near Miechów in Małopolska. In 1942 and 43, it has, the wood has witnessed executions of both Jewish and non-Jewish Poles, conducted by the Nazis with the bystanders' assistance. The vast majority of them were the Jews from the neighbor vi na nearby villages. Others have been transported by the narrow gauge railway passing through the woods. Mm, on the photo you can see the site of the mass grave with about a thousand of victims. In 1964, uh, the stone commemorating those events was placed in the middle of the field. Uh, and here I have this pre-war map, and I marked all three spots, uh, sites I'll be talking about. The Red Cross is the actual mass grave in, in the woods. It's still in the woods. The Blue Cross, it's now the field, and there is this uh, stone, uh, memorial, memorial stone. And the uh, Yellow Cross is the site I will be talking about just right uh, in a moment. The shutdown of the railway and the development of local agri agriculture led to the situation where visiting the site of memory marked by the stone became nearly impossible, as it was surrounded either by plowed soil on the, or the crops. Local people felt embarrassed that, I quote, those Jewish women on high hills have to wade through the mud. Around 2010, uh, Josef Jarno, who as a child witnessed the executions in Hodówki, made an effort to change the situation. And eventually, the new site of memory was erected on 6th November 2012. It's situated by the main road to Miechów. The Jewish stone became a neighbor of the Iron Cross related to Jewish, uh, non-Jewish Nazi victims uh, from Hodówki. And uh, it's hardly visible. Here is this cross, and it was there and we cannot establish the exact date till now, but probably from the 60s also. Here is this commemoration, the, this ceremony. Uh, so the Jewish stone became, uh, okay. The gesture symbolically subordinated Holocaust victims to the Catholic-centered repertoire of Polish memory culture as the initiators didn't consider Jewish religiously motivated sensibility about which Rabbi Joshua Ellis told us uh, on the first day of the conference. The commemoration became even more distant from the sacred, si sacred site of the buried bodies than before. Yet the representative of local Jewish community agreed for the initiative and attended the opening ceremony. The speech he gave during the ritual focused on the positive aspects of bringing Jewish and non-Jewish Poles to closer together. Um, his strategy could be interpreted as a compromise between the rules of the halacha and the needs for the local people to consider the difficult heritage as their own, on their own terms. Yet, soon after the opening of the site, Fundacja Zapomniane uh, went into the woods, found and marked the mass graves with wooden matzevas, 
Rabbi Ellis, uh, Ellis called them a form of guerrilla grave placing, right? That's, that's them. <laughs> this is it, right? Guerrilla grave places. Mm, I, I would like to cite another great formula of him. Uh, we need to mark those places for everyone involved. As it is hard to validate this belief uh, in the ther therapeutic power of such practices, I propose to perceive them as a part of wider process, in this case closely connected with the procession of the site of memory. We've observed that the whole county has been alerted by this movement, and other non-sites of memory related to Holocaust are currently being transformed, as if Hodówki was the center of some net, a local cenotaph. Okay, uh, as my time is going to finish soon, I will just briefly go through this slide of Bozentin and come to conclusions. There is a very strange situation in Bozentin I just would like to show you. Uh, this is my opening photo of the place where um, about 30 Roma people, Romani people were killed in also 1942. And as Romanis, Romani people are Catholic in Poland, those their bodies could be exhumated and moved into the local cemetery, and this is the case. There, is, there are no bodies uh, in the spot. Yet, the uh, Romani community felt the need to commemorate the spot. In 2011, this monument was erected, made by, by a, an artist. It's a most profane object I'm showing you today. Uh, there are no strictly religious, religious symbols, and there are no bodies, so even in this, um, even it's not sacred and not uh, religious, right? You may say. Yet it has been profaned. It has been vile. Uh, it has been distracted, and this distraction was uh, interpreted as a profanation. As a year after this, uh, a new grave was established on the cemetery with the representation of the monument. And then, during the celebration, a cross was carved inside this monument. You see, so the object, originally profane, has been like resacralized. Yet, it hasn't been sacred from the beginning. It was just made sacred by this strange vandal act of profanation. So the thing that is sacralized here, I think, is the memory of the genocide, to, to put it most simple. And what's interesting here is this innovative form of the ritual who was uh, kind of an answer to this conflicted site of memory and the, all the events. And a few concluding remarks, really quick. Sorry. I'm sure we have time during discussion. To okay, so, so let me just um, say what this post-secular uh, term means in the title of my presentation. I think it's the in, in, important thing. So text, objects, and action I presented, actions I presented were created through fragmentation, modification, contamination, and or profanation of traditional symbols. They indicate in inadequacy of both secular and denominational stances towards collective memory of the traumatic past. Some of them were marked by the memories of their creators, as well as by the problems of the Polish collective memory. As the pre-war cultural and religious diversity of Poland has been distracted, over half of the century uh, later, its ruins are used to cultivate remembrance of the victims. It is happening inside a difficult heritage community and is accomplished by the inventive negotiations resulting in the weakening of denominational identification of the interested parties. Cross-religious practices of commemoration seem vital to the post-genocidal culture. They are often fueled by personal stories and affected affects connected with specific objects and places, not fitting to any fixed religious mode of being. I propose to use the post-secular label to name those aspects of the presented cases where the religious and secular interests diffused are diffused and impact one another. And all the parties involved are aware of the inevitability of their cooperation in the public sphere, trying to make it as beneficial as possible and being open to new forms of commemoration. Thank you and very much. Okay, thank Sorry. you, Karina. Thank you for the presentation. And now I would like to ask our second presenter to take the floor. 
Naum Trajanovsky uh, with the presentation titled Panihida, Liturgy and Aparastas, Service in the Local Memory of a Contested Historical Event in Contemporary Republic of Macedonia. Naum is a memory scholar and a PhD candidate in the Institute for Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences. He was affiliated with the Institute of Advanced Studies in Koshak as a research fellow in 2016-2017 and with the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity. Currently, he is a part of the Executive Committee of the Philosophical Society of Macedonia and the Courage Connecting uh, Collections Project as an advisor and a proofreader. So please. Thanks. Thanks, Yulia. Uh, just briefly, this is a side project of mine, which I hope that will be published at some point next year. So without further ado, I would like to commence with the paper. Namely, it's a historical commonplace that the former southernmost Yugoslav state gained its first gained its first independence statehood as a result of the partisan struggle uh, during the World War II, which was followed by a state-sponsored nation building in the immediate post-war decades. Here, one can mention the codification of the Macedonian language from 1945, as well as the establishment of the Macedonian Orthodox Churches in 1958. While the infrastructure of the national myth mythology was further developed with the formation of the Macedonian Academy of Sciences, the Skopje University, the first national museum, and the Institute of National History in the same time period. Uh, the national pantheon of historical figures in these regards was not only inspired by the collective memory of the ethnic Macedonian community in the newly established political unit, uh, but also fostered in the period of unsettled Yugoslav-Bulgarian bilateral relations, a direct consequence of the Tito-Stalin split from 1948, the aftermath of the Greek Civil War, as well as the purges within the Macedonian Communist Party from the immediate post-war period. With the introduction of the political plural, plural, pluralism in 1991, the variety of historical voices in Macedonia became visible and finally, to a certain extent, possible. In terms of profiling the key juncture in the mnemonic arena, one can, one can easily point out to the 2006 electoral win of the right-wing coalition led by Vamara Depamanaya. Uh, even though Vamara Depamanaya's agenda from the early 1990s was much clearer, clearer on several historical revisionist issues, it barely translated into a particular memory policy during the first Depamanaya rule uh, from 1998 to 2001. On the contrary, the 10-year rule of the reformed and technocratic Depamanaya from 2006 to 2016 will be mostly identified with the major takeovers in the cultural sphere. With the project of Skopje 2014, an umbrella term endorsing more than 130 monuments and memorials in the very city center as a critical event in this setting. You can see some objects from the aforementioned project on the photo. The present paper aims to trace and map the developments of the Mara Buneva commemoration, a historical figure which trod the path from a subject of a peculiar counter mnemonic practice to a national martyr, as well as the path from an informal to a formal recognition within the two most recent decades of the Macedonian statehood. Since 2001, almost every year on 30th of January, a commemorative plaque dedicated to Buneva was mounted and immediately afterwards just demolished in the capital city of Skopje. Bunava, born in 1902, affiliated with the rightist interwar internal Macedonian revolutionary organization, is famous for her assassination of Velmil, Velmir Prelic, high representative of the Kingdom of Slo uh, Serbs, Croats, and Slovene on the ter territory of Macedonia. The Bunava's case uh, is interesting from three particular perspectives. Firstly, the assassination spot in the very city center, which you can see practically next to the candelabrum on the photo presented, holds a history of contested claims and political solutions from being completely isolated in the pre-World uh, War II period to serving as a significant memory site during the Bulgarian occupation in the war years, and further on being uh, secluded anew in the course of the Yugoslav period. Uh, the incentive to reinvent this particular place of memory is leading to the second point, namely the large-scale mobilizing potential which the relatively minuscule commemorative plaque and the relatively uh, short event contains. 
from 2001. Uh, the commemoration serve as a platform for, express, for expressing mnemonic claims by both Bulgarian and pro-Bulgarian activists, performing a pilgrimage-like tours to the assassination site. Finally, the event as such had the religious coloring as its defining feature. The commemorative plaque is placed at the point where Buneva committed the assassination, shortly after the religious memorial service which takes place in the nearby uh, East, Eastern Orthodox Church of Saint Dimitrius, Sveti Dimitri in Macedonia. The same church prelate visited, visited just moments before his assassination. To commence with, I will argue that the discursive shift was focal in the course of the recent mnemonic reimagination of Buneva in the Macedonian setting, with a religious centered narrative framework facilitating the juncture. Okay. okay. In order to present the event and the consequent mnemonic changes, a three-party three model of the recent Macedonian uh, mnemoscape will be drawn, structured upon the conceptual arsenal offered by Kubik and Berfen. In this regards, the period from 2001 and to 2018 uh, is to be divided in three periods, each one delineated with the distinct mnemonic agenda of the relevant political actors and agencies. Along these lines, the set of 18 Bunawas commemorations will be reconstructed, triangulating the media outlines, the institutional discourses, and the political rhetoric. And finally, it will be discussed in reference to the three-party periodization model. Uh, the questions of how the religious center discursive practices contributed to the reinvention of the commemorative fever, in Mishtal's words, and moreover, how the three sets of commemorative uh, activities communicated with the official memory in diachronic and synchronic perspectives will be approached and discussed prospectively. Okay. Uh, the first Bunewas commemoration appeared in 2001. The period from 1991 to 2001, uh, or the prehistory of the commemorative activities uh, marks no mnemonic activity as such. Uh, Bunava's name can be traced only in few occasions in the Macedonian media in this period. Firstly, as a side topic of four feltons in 1991, 1993, 1994, and 1997, all of them critical of the rightist uh, Vemero and affirming the canonic interpretations on the Macedonian interwar period. And secondly, in 2000, with the assassinate, assassination presented within the Today in History genre or section of the largest media holding Nova Macedonia, a single entry in the post-Yugoslav Macedonian mediascape. In these regards, it was the first set of commemorations from 2001 which brought Buneva higher on the social and political agenda. The first period is illustrating two particular tendencies. The attempt to endorse Buneva by a group of Depomanai politicians in the course of the first Depomanai government, a process involving few Depomanai high-ranking affiliates participating in the commemoration from 2002. On the picture you can saw the then Minister of Internal Affairs. Uh, the, and two, the clear consensus on the Buneva's role, quote unquote, in the Macedonian history, traceable as an immediate public re reaction to the commemorations and even visible as a diplomatic official reproach on the mem memorial practices. Interestingly enough, the reconciliative discourse is also reproduced in the wake of the Buneva's commemoration. The narrative link of the hostility from 2001 with the terrorist activities of Buneva, as put by Katarjiev, a historian, is telling the most in the given context. Katarjiev depicts Buneva as a, quote, tragic person, unquote, and a historical figure which should be definitely not be commemorated. The second set of Buneva's commemorations is clearly delineated with the physical confrontations from 2007, which contributed to a general refashioning of the commemorative model and raise the ceremony to a higher bilateral level. And secondly, with the introduction of, the, of a mnemonic warrior in the Macedonian mnemonic scape, namely the reformed Depemanaya from 2006. Thus, if the Bunevas commemoration raised the question of the level of politicization of the cultural sphere in the immediate post-conflict period, 
then the symbolic capital and the mobilizing potential of January 13th has clearly dominated the second set of commemorations. In these regards, two particular trajectories are to be distinguished. On one hand, one can stress the peculiar tendency of reimagining the Bunava's historical role within the political mythoscape of the Macedonian nationalism. The political strategy, which can be traced back to the prolifera proliferation of a state-sponsored historical publishing, as well as uh, a trajectory which culminated with the introduction of the Bunavas wax figure in the newly established Museum of the Macedonian Struggle, opened in 2011. On the other hand, the still bottom-up commemorative event was subject of heated contestations, frequently provoked by state agencies, thus resulting in a quite paradoxical setting. Buneva's deed was endorsed and promote, promoted, while the commemorative event was scapegoated as such. Illustratively enough, the 2007 ceremony ended up with more than 15 injured participants. An unofficial note from the Bulgarian embassy and was also discussed as such within the European Parliament. While the celebration next year was canceled due, due to a risk of eruption, with a go-away graffiti on the very assassination site appearing just, just hours before the, the event. The final juncture in terms of the Bunavas commemorations appeared in 2014, with the peculiar dial dialectics visible in the previous set of commemorations, resulting in a final endorsement of Bunava, both the historical person and the historical event, and the modern day commemorations. The critical event, event in the given context is the ethnic Macedonian mobilization around the religious service of Bunava on January 13, 2014. A group of ethnic Macedonians gathered around the Saint, Saint Demetrius Church uh, in order to stop the service by the uh, quote, Bulgarian provocators, unquote, which announced the religious commemoration in the, again, uh, Bulgarian church just a few day, days before. Moreover, uh, after the demolishment of the memorial plaque in the eve of January 13th, a clear tendency of a full Bunevas whitewashing is traceable within the Macedonian public. In these regards, the mnemonic communities and organizations claim, uh, claiming legacy over the historical Vumereo stated the Macedonian origins of, of Bunava. The discourse over Bunava was further loaded with personal accounts. Her niece, her niece take on herself was considered as a major, major finding. Uh, what is interesting in this context is the institutional discourse by the religious bodies present in the media outlets as official statements from the religious authorities. On one hand, the Bunawas commemoration was frequently questioned by the religious authorities during the first two commemorative phases with the notion of commemorate, commemorating a person who committed suicide as an underlying argument. After 2014, however, the discourse as such is not traceable within the press releases and moreover, one can spot the several priests attending and further on endorsing the, the commemorative events as you can see on the photo. On the other hand, one can trace a particular shift in the media reports on the Bunevas commemorations from defining the religious service or liturgy as a parastos in the course of the two first two periods to a panihida in the wake of the second one and throughout the course of the final commemorative set. Now, uh, even though the parastos and panihida appear as synonyms in the recent uh, Macedonian Orthodox literature, one can trace certain interpretations which differ across the private public axis of the aforementioned concepts. Parastos, in this context, implies a smaller gathering reserved for the narrow family, while Panihida suggests a public ceremony suitable for public figures. As such, the media outlets have rarely legitimized the institutional discourse with a further investment of meaning on the Buneva's commemoration and Buneva herself. The most recent commemorative services from 2017 and 2018 are illustrating the best the above mentioned dynamics. The religious part of the ceremony is clearly taking place within an ethnocentric domain, namely the Macedonian church, Macedonian heroine as such, followed by a diverse group of, of mnemonic communities commemorating the assassination on the very spot.
just to conclude, the case of the Mara Bunelas commemoration in Skopje from 2001 to 2018, even though marginal, is illustrative enough for the contemporary Macedonian Nemoscape. The paper aimed to unfold the social and political endorsement of Bunela as traced in the given time period. The main argument in these regards is that the institutional discourse of the religious authorities further recreated by the media outlets fostered the process of mnemonic reimagination re of Bunela. The struggle over Bunela's legacy resulted into a derivative encompassing of her, quote, revolutionary activity, unquote, and moreover, she was granted a high position within the newly promoted rightist historical narrative. I would stop here. Okay, thank you for fitting in time perfectly. Thank you, and uh, now I'm glad to invite to take a floor our third presenter, Vera Herald from Portugal Catholic University in Porto with the title of her presentation, The Protestant Lisabona Deutsche Between Wars, a Palimpsestos reading of a Pacific War Memorial in Bel Pacifist War Memorial in Bellicose Times. Vera uh, is a PhD candidate in cultural studies at Universidade Católica de Lisbon Consortium and currently preparing her thesis on the subject of the Lisabona Deutsche during the 1930s and 1940s. The provisional title of her thesis is Needed Post Memories, the Lisabona Deutsche between anecdotal memory and the making of history. Please, Vera. Thank you, thank you for your kind introduction. Thank you for being here for a wonderful, very interesting and beautifully organized conference. And uh, I will start. My paper focuses on a German war memorial in Lisbon, Portugal. It is part of my larger research project, the PhD dissertation already mentioned, um, with which I'm familiarly entangled. The memorial was erected between 1934 and 1936, and it is located on a side yard of the German Protestant Church in Lisbon, as it had to be on German ground, Portugal and Germany having been on opposite sides during the First World War. It was planned as a war memorial, as an integral part of the new church building for the fallen of the First World War of the German community. And it was being planned while the church, a new church was being planned as well. It, was, it would be built during the events surrounding Hitler's rise to power. The memorial underwent changes in its concept and its form several times until 1995. I will first make an introduction for context, then ask, uh, make a short visual analysis of the memorial and argue that it can be read as a palimpsest of the parish history of the 1930s and the 1940s. So, German Remembrance Day, Volkstrauertag, had been created in 1924 by the Volksbund Deutscher Kriegsgräber für Sorge, a private organization for the care of the soldiers' graves. It was a nationalist ceremony, as were those in the other countries involved in the First World War. But it had a broad and inclusive basis of support from both Christian denominations, as well as from Jewish parishes. And this inclusiveness would be lost in 1934, when the Nazi government seized and transformed the um, Volkstrauertag and turned it into Heldengedenktag, Heroes Remembrance Day. The organization was handled to Goebbels' propaganda ministry and gave way to the exclusionary visions of the Nazi state Volksgemeinschaft, a community solely based on ethnicity and party conformity. In Germany, Helden, the change to Heldengedenktag, though radical in its renaming, was a slow process with new elements being introduced over the years. During the previous decade, the ceremony had been doubly mournful for Germany because Germany could not link the massive casualties to a military victory, as could the Entente uh, countries. By 1935, the association handling the Volkstrauertag had been Nazified and enthusiastically welcomed the change of perspective, highlighting the fact that now pride would prevail over sorrow with the following words. We no longer remember them in mournful pain, but we look up with proud emotion to those who are bailed for a new Germany. The meaning and the politics of this ritual would undergo a profound change already encapsulated in this new name, 
with visuals and rhetorics illustrating the move from sorrow to glory and from religious to the profane between 1934 and 1944. In Germany, with growing military parades that were emulated uh, in smaller towns in a smaller scale. But how were these changes felt and how were they performed in the German diasporic communities? In this case, in Lisbon, where everything was necessarily smaller and started at a different point in time. Very shortly on Germans abroad. Auslandsdeutschtum, Germanness abroad, was an important nationalist concept already in Wilhelmine, Germany, in the construction of a greater German empire that would exceed the territorial frontiers of the 1871 empire. Through the German language and its culture, building on older concepts of a German Kulturnation, the diaspora was incorporated in the empire, while at the same time the diaspora also fed back into the empire. It became an important part in Germany's nation building. One axis along which these transnationalist ideas were spread bidirectionally was the network of the German Protestant Church. While its educational role was as important as that of the school system, its moral, spiritual, and religious authority added legitimacy to the increasingly nationalist discourse and the empire's transnational aspirations, especially after 1900, when pastors started to have clear instructions not only on their spiritual, but as well on their political tasks. After the First World War, this discourse was further exacerbated with the concept of Auslandsdeutschtum turning more and more into a sort of german dumb instead of German-ness, with all the connotations of power that the suffix of dumb suggests. Suffix to think of kingdom, Christendom, etc. The situation of the German community in Lisbon was different from the German diasporas in the East that inspired, especially after the First World War, this change in, in perception. Many were merchants or scientists and professionals forming an economic and a cultural elite, and their environment was urban and not rural. But the new nationalist discourse around Auslandsdeutschtum eventually permeated all diasporas. Many of these German merchants and businessmen were Protestants who found themselves in Catholic Portugal. Between the 16th and the 18th century, foreign Protestant parishes had to place themselves under the protection of a foreign legation in order not to be persecuted, namely by the Inquisition. This explains the strong link of Protestant diasporas with the German state in the 20th century. With the Great War, the Lissabonner Deutsche had experienced exile and the confiscation of the business and private property, as well as an extreme form of wholesale denaturalization that I have no time to go into, but I can explain in the, the Q&A. Most young men had joined the German army or had been drafted, spending formative years in an increasingly nationalist Germany. When they returned to Portugal after 1920 to rebuild their private lives and organizations, their circumstances and attitudes had changed. So immediately after Hitler's rise to power, the Nazi party implemented the process of Gleichschaltung, the Nazification, between 1933 and 36. Even the Protestant Church was not spared of the seizure of power by the Deutsche Christen, a Nazi pressure group within the German Protestant Church, created in 1932 and resulting in what became known as the Kirchenkampf, the church struggle. Abroad, the foreign organization of the party ensured Nazi conformity as well uh, of its diasporic citizens and organizations by placing officials in every important city. The boards of all organizations had to have a number of party members in order to continue to receive funds from the German state. In Lisbon, this was the case with the German school, the German hospital, the Protestant church, the German aid organization, the German club, etc. Many old board members enrolled in the party during that period in what seems to have been an attempt to avoid a complete takeover by hardline party members. From 1933 to 36 were also the years the Protestant parish started to build a new church. Its previous church had been confiscated and auctioned off with other German property in 1916. On the screen, you can see the timeline of this enterprise and how it weaves in with Hitler's rise to power and how it was headed for trouble. Though at first the parish seemed to be spared the church struggle. Probably the Auslandsbischof, the bishop 
responsible for the diasporas, Theodor Heckel in Berlin. He's on the picture. It's the oldest gentleman standing at the right on the, on the, on the first step. Um, he probably thought he didn't have to worry much about Lisbon. But this was about to change with the events surrounding the war memorial, which was being erected while the church was being finished. It was designed by a young, recently arrived German artist, Hein Zemke, a protégé of the German minister in Lisbon and of the parish's very young pastor. Zemke had an anarchist and communist past and had spent six years in prison in Germany in the 20s for unruly behavior in demonstrations, an information the ambassador and the pastor did not share with the party. But they found out, and when his modernist sculptures were spotted by hardline party members, they were declared degenerate art, becoming the object and the pretext for a war between the party and the parish, leading to the disappearance and probable destruction of one of the sculptures. It only ended in 1936 with a compromise solution that involved the voluntary, in inverted commas, resignation of the pastor after the upcoming 175th anniversary festivities, which were in 36. When the memorial was inaugurated in Lisbon, Volkstrauertag, Remembrance Day, had already become Heroes' Remembrance Day. The fact that it was the party that commemorated Heroes' Remembrance Day on the churchyard further strained an already tense relationship between the two organizations. It repeatedly led to conflicts due to the scheduling of party events coinciding with Sunday service on the churchyard. So, in fact, the church suppressed a number of services to avoid further conflicts with other uh, party events. Though the ceremony was organized by the party's local leadership, as well as by the military attaches at the, at the legation, it also involved the families of the four fallen soldiers and the remaining parish members. At that time, many did not see Heroes Remembrance Day as an usurpation of Remembrance Day because it was an altogether new ceremony, and many liked the sense of pride after what they had felt was a humiliating peace treaty for Germany. A very subjective uh, point of view. To them, these ceremonies still were sacred and represented a moment of national recollection. Others, however, had recognized the incompatibility, even the grotesqueness of Heldengedenktag on the churchyard. It emulated the rallies held in Germany in secular buildings, with the Lisbon churchyard decked in Nazi flags, local Nazi leadership in full uniform, the Heil Hitler salute, Nazi songs. It was, however, also a ceremony that was difficult to escape in this close-knit community, where everybody's business and professional success now depended on the party's goodwill. The Lisbon microcosm provides insights into the problematic created by this appropriation of Remembrance Day. The religious implication of the ceremony were impossible to get rid of in Lisbon because the church was just behind the wall and the pastor's home around the corner. So this is the church in the 1930s and initially the memorial consisted of a text plague and three sculptures. The text plaque reflects the official discourse featuring four names of four male parish members who fell in that war, followed by the phrasing that can be found in all World War I memorials in various countries, fell for the fatherland. Himmelfahrt des Krieges is a um, life-size bas-relief that depicts two angels holding the naked body of a dead soldier. Uh, the translation is Ascension of the Warrior. Uh, they hold the naked body of a dead soldier who holds a broken sword in his hand. And the next sculpture, the Trauende, the mourning woman, is a mourning woman cast in cement. Both still exist. But there was a third sculpture, Comradeship of the Downfall. This larger-than-life sculptural ensemble So here you see, you see the sculpture. So it was really a very, very big, um, big sculpture or sculptural ensemble. And it was called Comradeship of the Downfall. This sent a different message. The enormous size of the soldiers, their archaic and robust bodies, as you can see, their strong hands contrast with the very precarious situation they are in and the danger. They will die. These men, whose size would suggest that they were invincible titans, 
convey a sense of utter defeat and of death. Although its modernist and quite monumental aesthetic could have pleased the party, the message it conveyed did not. The memorial was therefore ordered dismantled by the party and was partially re-erected once the demise of the pastor had been assured. Comradeship of the downfall was banned from the memorial. It is said to have been destroyed, not overnight by unruly party members, as legend would have it, though no one really knows how and by whom. But the important thing is that without Kamachatschaft, without the sculptural ensemble, the memorial's original message is erased and a new one was written over it. And this lack operates a complete shift in the meaning of the remaining plague and the two sculptures that survived. The Bari Lev, Ascension of the Warrior, can be interpreted either as a heroization, I'll just go back, as a heroization or a victimization of the fallen warrior, whereas the Trauende depicts the mourning mother or sister just the concession states have always made to those women who lose family members to the state's wars. Comradeship, however, would have given the key for the interpretation of the whole war memorial, as it conveys the senselessness of war and the utter destruction it wreaks among both the dead and the surviving. It would have been comradeship to make us notice that the archaic angels of ascension of the warrior do not look at the warrior, or towards heaven, but they look to us, returning our gaze and questioning us. And the Trauende, the mourning woman, who would have stood at the entrance of the memorial with Kameradschaft behind it. You can see it, there is a picture at the right. Thank you. Um, without it, she no longer stands as a warning and a guardian at the entrance of a literal and metaphorical descent into death. She merely stands outside the memorial, severed from the war, becoming its mere consequence, and just representing Hegelian genera generalized womankind. Grieving for a man of her kin, she had, no sac she had to sacrifice to a state to which she, as a woman, does not belong. And here I'm thinking with Judith Butler's Antigone's claim. In palimpsests, texts would be erased when they were no longer valued and substituted by new ones that reflected new times. In the case of this churchyard, we may argue that the original concept by the artist is a subversive pacifist hypotext that was overwritten by the 1935 hypertext, the hypertext being the removal and destruction of the statue. This hypertext was caused by what Foucault describes the reversal of a relationship of forces, the usurpation of power, the appropriation of a vocabulary turned against those who once used it. After World War II, the infamous Nazi interpretation was overwritten with yet another hypertext, enhancing the very first pacifist hypertext, while acknowledging the previous hypertext, which is now a painful second hypertext. Ever since, the memorial has become palimpsestuous through its coming to terms with the totality of its past. Sarah Dillon clearly defines the difference between palimpsest reading and palimpsestuous reading, the first being interested in the mere resurrection of the erased underlying hypotext, while the second undertakes the challenging task of reading the whole web of the various texts and the ways they relate to each other. And that is what I want to do. A palimpsestuous reading does not look at the text as layers that follow each other and can be separated, opposing Foucault's supranational historical, super historical point of view, adopting instead his concept of genealogy that makes an unstable point of view, which is of palimpsestuous nature itself. I will try to deepen over two minutes um, with Dylan my palimpsestuous reading of the memorial and extract meaning from the way the texts interlock, fully aware that in doing so, I am using what Dylan calls the palimpsest's perpetual openness to new inscriptions and in palimpsesting myself. After 1945, a second plague was added with a pacifist message remembering all that of the Second World War. And 50 years later, at the initiative of the Church Council, it was decided to write once more on the palimpsest. It was the 60th anniversary of the Heinzemke episode and the destruction of the, of the um, sculptures, and the artist was still alive, so it was done in collaboration with him. A small plaque was attached to the wall of the churchyard, signaling the missing sculpture. It reads, 
in this courtyard stood the further sculptural ensemble by Hein Zemken. At a time when victories meant more than love and mourning, it was destroyed, 1995. The artist presented the parish with a bronze cast bath of a bas relief, the plaster model of which he had created in 1935. It is titled Crucified Once More, and it shows the dead body of Christ, held by a group of six men with World War I warriors and four figures in wearing cassocks, of which at least one is, um, is a pastor with a Bible. It engages in a dialogue with all previous texts, not trying to recreate the artist's initial intention, but rather invoking, ev from a contemporaneous point of view, everything that had happened in this memorial and talking to all the involuted texts. Crucified once more mirrors the whole genealogy of this site, and created in 1935, I don't know whether it is already a commentary of the artists to the events and the destruction of his sculpture, or if he had done it before. But now it is part of the memorial, and of the, it is palimpsestius itself, and it is part of the palimpsest. So I end. Paraphrasing, paraphrasing Andreas Hussen in Present Pasts about Berlin as a palimpsest. This war memorial emerged as, emerges as an architectural and sculptural text rewritten at various moments from the initial distortion in 1935 to this day. It preserves its previous plagues and surviving sculptures, restores traces and documents erasures with the superimposition of the World War II remembrance and the 60th anniversary admission of responsibility as well as Hein Zemke's Barrelief Vida Gekreuzigt that holds a mirror to the parish and the memorial's genealogy, resulting in a complex web of historical markers that hopefully point towards a heterogeneous and open future for this parish through the recognition of it, its ambivalent past. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Thank you very much. And now I would like to pass the floor to Ala Marchenko with the presentation Memory and Politics in the Soviet Union case of the Hasidic pilgrimage in Uman. Uh, currently, Ala is writing her second PhD dissertation about the effects of the Hasidic pilgrimages upon the local frames of memory in Ukraine and Poland. Ala is currently based in Graduate School for Social Research, Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences. She previously worked at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kyiv, where she defended her candidate's dissertation. Her current academic interests include comparative research, historical sociology, memory studies in Ukraine and Poland, and Jewish heritage. Please, Ala. Thank you so much for such a nice introduction and thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a big pleasure to, to participate in such interesting disc discussions. And I will try to be as precise as possible to speak about such a wide topic within 20 minutes. And um, I would actually start with basic def definitions. As you see maybe from the beginning, I would speak about vernacular memory, about the Hasidic pilgrimages, about women and uh, such, I don't know, prim primordialistic word re re reborn. So why, why do I speak about that? Speaking about vernacular memory, I uh, treat it as a, a classical concept el elaborated by Bodnar, also by Marshall, that it's a memory uh, connected to some recollections of a specific community. Um, I treat collective memory here also in a very wide meaning as a, a, a form of, as, as a form of public rem, rem, remembrance in monu monuments, in labels, in different inscriptions which can be found in public spa 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 spaces. In such regard, I would uh, um, focus my pre presentation especially on this public form of collective memory. I will speak about Uman because it's um, a city, it's a town actually in central Ukraine, which is by co coincidence is my native town. Uh, it's, a, it's a town where uh, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims come to celebrate New Year. That's what everyone can see or maybe look up in the media. And uh, that's a town which is connected to very contradictory memory, which I will speak about now. 
and I use the word reborn. So it means that uh, being reborn after the Soviet Union means that uh, these pilgrimages, they started off right after the death of uh, a big Hasidic uh, rabbi, which, who is called Rabbi Nachman, and uh, who died in 1810. The first uh, celebration, uh, the, the, the first comm comm commemoration, the, the first pilgrims actually came in 1811, like in other cases when, 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 when person dies, the first comm commemoration starts a year after. And uh, these uh, not very numerous gatherings uh, lasted uh, until the Soviet Union times, until actually uh, the beginning of 1930s. In 1930s, all the synagogues and all other religious um, organizations uh, and buildings, they were closed down, they were for forbidden, and um, the pilgrimages were banned. It's actually supposed, especially in some Hasidic circles, that um, the pilgrimages took place in a hidden uh, ma manner. So uh, some hidden um, trips of uh, one pilgrim, of two pilgrims, of uh, tens of pilgrims, they took place even during the Soviet Union. But we speak about some um, officially proclaimed event, we speak about mass event, which uh, uh, took place uh, in 1988 for the first time, and from that time on it uh, goes on and on, and it's, it, it de develops and it, it becomes bigger and bigger. And uh, right now we could speak about uh, tens of uh, uh, hundreds uh, um, and tens of thousands of pilgrims in specific periods. So. My research questions, why? Um, I'm interested in how vernacular memory of the Hasidic pilgrims is articulated in the public space of women, taking into account this very specific context, uh, that uh, this uh, memory which existed or existed in some specific uh, uh, meanings uh, or, and was kind of resurrected, reborn, and how it interacts with so-called official memory, which is uh, uh, also um, a, a, a kind of official understanding of uh, local authorities, of regional authorities, of national authorities in Ukraine of, of this pilgrimage. And my tentative hypothesis is that um, re researchers may apply the concept ant antagonistic to tolerance, which was elaborated by uh, Joseph Haydn in 2002, to the analysis of official and vernacular memory mani manifestations, especially at the Hasidic sites of Uman. And just a very brief description. Ant antagonistic to tolerance means that there is some dominant memory, and there is or there are some minor, um, uh, some minorities that also have their, their memories. But um, this dominant memory doesn't suppress the minor memories. It means that there can be conflict, there can be uh, different types of um, uh, mutual rep representations, but they still exist all together. And, um, I, uh, and my idea was that if, if we could find that there are various versions of um, um, interactions of such types of memories, it can be a sign that this concept can be used. So, uh, a brief word on my methodology. So, I um, uh, focus on visual embodiment of vernacular memory in public space, and I will take the consideration of the vernacular memory on the pilgrim side. And I will use structural and functional analysis uh, of such objects in Uman, mm, actually my uh, photos and observations, which I made in March of this year, in August this year. I also had some observations in, in September, but I did not include them for, for the reason of um, um, making this research in integral by a certain dead deadline. And uh, uh, also, um, I have uh, con concentrated my attention upon five most visible and most interesting objects of the analysis uh, to understand what is going on and what kinds of interactions can be found over there. I also used um, archival uh, uh, research, and my previous research on this topic, as this topic is, uh, is the one which I research uh, for uh, several years already, and it will be a part of my uh, um, doctoral dis uh, dissertation too. Uh, so um, I would say that uh, I have found five interesting patterns of interacting um, uh, different uh, kinds of memories. And I will start from, from, from the first one. It's an interaction between an official uh, uh, mem memory declared by the state and vernacular memory of the pilgrims. 
Unlike other cases which were um, described in our panel on, and in other panels too, I would say that um, uh, the, ma the major uh, uh, shri shrine, the focal point where all the pilgrims come, is the point which is called the grave of Rabbi Nachman, the person who died, as I told, in 1810. And this is a place which uh, uh, looked like that, or looked like that in August 2018. There was some preparation for New Year, Rosh Hashanah, so you could see some construction which was not elaborated at the time, but it, will, it, uh, it was elaborated next in, in September. This is a part of um, former uh, living district. So initially it was a part of um, Mm, very lively, actually, living district, uh, sur surrounded by multi-storied buildings. Um, um, a building which was located exactly at the place where this grave is, and several other buildings were one-storied buildings. So, uh, um, what, we what we could see here may, be may look slightly different from what we see here. So, it's the same place, the same grave, and how the Hasidim prayed in the yard of the private house. The, the, photo, the earliest photo I managed to find in the UMA Local Museum's archive, it's 1993. And we could see the same place, but it's still a building, a, a private building where people live. And this building actually was, um, how to say, it was, consider, uh, it, it was considered a part of the territory which was demolished during the uh, uh, sec sec Second World, World, World War and which was uh, completely um, rebuilt uh, after that uh, and initially it was a Jewish cemetery. Uh, so, um, um, as we see, in 1993, it's already five years uh, uh, from the first official coming of pilgrims. We could see that um, the pilgrims came just to the building uh, to, com to, to com 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 commemorate it. And it, it happened in 1994 that this place was declared uh, as a place of uh, heritage, of local heritage and uh, of regional importance heritage. And um, this place was transformed into what we saw just in the, in the, in the previous picture. So uh, the people were resettled, the buildings were demolished, the buildings actually, there were three, three buildings, they were demolished and we could see this is a grave now, this is a um, um, entrance to the grave, it's a man's part of the entrance, there, there is also on the right side a female's entrance to the grave. And I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting illustration of this um, interaction of official memory and vernacular memory, where the vernacular memory actually protruded uh, the official declarations of all these uh, uh, heritage sites and sites of importance. Um, it's also very interesting that, um, I will come back to it later in my last uh, part of this presentation, um, now we could see that um, the, the place became so po popular among the pilgrims that uh, there are many new buildings and hotels uh, are being built in Uman and we could see an advertisement like my home is in Uman. And we could see that this advertisement is not in Ukrainian, yes. It's in uh, English, uh, English and also Hebrew, which we will see in a moment are the most popular languages there, which also m means that uh, these messages are translated not to, not to the locals. So they, they are translated to, the, um, uh, to some people who come to Uman. Uh, the second um, pattern of interaction which I found, um, I found that uh, Mm, of course, when we speak about the Hasidic pilgrimage, and we use it as a conventional uh, also um, concept, because otherwise we could, we could be lost, as well as vernacular memory. It's a conventional concept, because there are, very, uh, there are many um, different groups which represent various interests, and they also belong to different uh, parts of the Hasidic movement, or different courts. And actually, we could see that the whole area around uh, the grave of Rabbi Nachman, or we could see, uh, we could say, a street named after Pushkin. It's that the whole district is, a, is an arena for various vernacular memories of several competing groups of pilgrims. And we could see it quite obviously. For instance, um, um, in August 2018, we could see a wall, maybe it's, it's from a distance, but you could see in the very, very center of that picture, uh, Rab uh, Chief Sephardi Rabbi of Israel, Ovadia Yosef, who recently died. And it's a commemoration of this rabbi. 
this rabbi has nothing to do with the woman pilgrimage or rabbi, rabbi Nachman. But I mean, so this is the, um, this is also a visual rep rep representation of this spe specific Sephardi community. Or we could see an, an advertisement uh, which commemorates a Satmar Hasidic rabbi, Yol Teitelbaum, very important rabbi, and Satmar Hasidim are the Hasidim who uh, were living in um, Hungary. So it's a Hungarian group which has. I mean, in, in, in historical meaning, nothing to do with Uman, but we can see some representation of this rabbi who also died several years ago, and this is considered to be a very important rabbi. Or we could see a Lubavitcher Hasidic rabbi, a very also well-known Hasidic group, uh, Chabad, and we could see also the rabbi who also died <laughs> in 2000 years. Uh, in another uh, wall, so it's also a commemoration of another. So it's com just uh, uh, for a general understanding, these groups are completely different groups, they, and they have their own rep representation of whom uh, we should commemorate, of, of, of who should be com commemorated in a place which was initially thought as a place of Rabbi Nachman only. Or we could see an advertisement commemorating another dina, dina, dynasty, Karaster Hasidic dynasty founder, Yeshua Steiner. And it's also Karaster dynasty, it's also a Hungarian dynasty, which has nothing to do with the territory of this. So, but we could see that different groups come and they represent themselves and their patterns of, comm of commemoration. Who, sh who should be comm commemorated? Then, when we go outside of the street and when we, and when, and, and when we move on, we could see um, a symbolic battle also of various vernacular memories, opposite vernacular memories about the space. And for instance, we could see, uh, well, this is a picture which maybe, no, I think it's visible. We could see a picture, and in the center of this picture, there is a cross, a, a crucifix, actually. And this crucifix uh, on the bank of a local river rep represents some interests of some um, Ukrainian uh, um, uh, local activists uh, or, or Uman local activists. Uh, this uh, uh, crucifix was erected in 2013 by this group. And actually, this cross is erected right in front of the arm here, standing, taking this picture, um, uh, on a place where Hasidic people gather. And they also use this river as a mikvah, as a place where they have the rich, ritual base, basin. And also, if you pay attention, if you take a look closer at these um, uh, stones, you could see some inscriptions over there. So this is an interesting dialogue of what Hasidic uh, people uh, want to say to this you know, cross, cross, crucifix, yes. Um, and um, actually it was, uh, um, uh, it's, a, it's a dialogue and uh, it's, it's not just the beginning of a dialogue, it's a continuing, it's a continuing, continuing, continuing dialogue. And uh, I will say what it is written there, but let's have a look at the picture which was uh, um, also maybe shown in many, many international news uh, that uh, this, uh, this uh, crucifix was des desecrated. You can see Hebrew inscription, inscriptions, and it is written like Messiah will come, which means that this is not a real Messiah, Messiah will come. And here, if we come back, we could see also the same like um, Messiah will come. It's written in, in Hebrew. So when people do not read Hebrew, they can just come, come over and they don't understand. So it's also a, a message directly for the people who read Hebrew, exactly for the, most of them are Israeli pilgrims, so they are against this. Yeah, but this is like written under, underneath. And uh, we could see um, a dispute of vernacular memory of the Bratislav uh, Hasidic pilgrims, which were initial group or fo focal group here, and the official memory offered in the town where the letter of the rules. So take a look on this. So this is a fence. This is a fence by a local Ukrainian plant megometer. Now it's a private plant, but it was state plant. Now it's like semi private semi-state, but mostly private. So what do you see there? Ma uh, almost nothing, yeah, some fence. But when you look look at this, you know, very, very little space, you could see. So th there is some building, and this is a former uh, great synagogue, which was closed down in 1937. And it is supposed to be a part of this uh, megometer plant, and there is also another synagogue, which was um, a Hasidic synagogue, but it, it, it is located uh, somewhere there, so people are not allowed to come in, so it was my hidden photo, which I took, I mean, not hidden, but I mean, it, it was open, but only from that 
from that part. And uh, it means that um, uh, it's not officially declared still that these are the, are the synagogues. Uh, official point is uh, ambivalent, and sometimes it's more about it's, uh, it was never a synagogue or it was a synagogue, but let's not uh, come down to this, and, and so on and so on. But if um, um, we could speak about the last um, 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 pattern of uh, um, interaction of these memories, we could speak about symbolic battle of official memory and vernacular memory of the Hasidic pil pilgrims in this space. And when we look just opposite uh, to the um, uh, great synagogue place, which we just saw, we could see some monument, and it's a monument to the leaders of uh, Ukrainian, okay, Ukrainian insurgents uh, mass uprising in uh, 1768. Um, it's called Koli Ivshina, yes, uh, uh, um, and this is a monument which was erected in 2015. And actually, um, this monument uh, is also a dialogue. It can be uh, not a dialogue, like it's a strict answer of some also. Uh, right, right wing or nationalistic oriented uh, uh, political forces and the same and the same organizations which erected the cross over there, as you saw by the river. And um, if we take uh, a brief, very very brief detour of uh, why the Hasidic leader was buried there, he was, he never lived in Uman, this Rabbi Nachman, but he came to Uman and he had, um, according also again to the religious sources, he came there to be buried because. Many people uh, were uh, of Jewish origin were mm, killed during this mass uprising, and it is also a common uh, idea that uh, among the pilgrims that they come uh, to commemorate also uh, just uh, to com to commemorate the leader, but also to take uh, mm, com uh, to take part in commem in some you know symbolic commemorations of all those victims. And this are the, and this is the monument to the leaders of this uprising. Um, all in all, uh, we could speak that this situation is in progress. We see these five different patterns, and uh, situ uh, situation is in progress, uh, and it's not um, uh, just a brief word. Yeah, and we could say that uh, the, um, a new or new patterns could appear, or, or some patterns could uh, be erased quite soon, because this year, 2018, is connected with big um, questions of new renaming in Uman. So it's uh, the first question is the question of renaming of the street where the rabbi is buried. Uh, uh, now the street is called Street of Gre Gregory Kosenka, Ukrainian writer. Uh, earlier it was called Street of Vissarion Belinsky. Uh, now uh, the decision is about to be made to be re uh, for, it to, for it to be renamed into Rabbi Nachman Street. And in September 2018, um, uh, like the second uh, pro uh, um, the procedure of this uh, double renaming, so um, uh, local authorities they decided to take it um, in, in such a way to have another street uh, uh, street named after Chelyuskinse. Um, um, uh, to rename it into street of Grigory Kosenka, and then we will have two streets of Grigory Kosenka. And then the street of uh, Grigory Kosenka would be renamed into uh, Rabbi Nachman Street. So it's a situation. So, and it's, it's going on right now, I mean. So new conflicts may appear also in, in terms of this. And new conflicts by the river crucifix were f also fixed in September 2018 when some fire took place near that, 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 that crucifix. You can also find some information. But uh, up to now, we have five patterns of interaction between all these types of vernacular and official memories. And we could see this variety of, uh, of interactions, which actually, uh, however they um, uh, seem, I don't know, strange or sometimes rude, they demonstrate that uh, uh, coexistence of all of them and competing of all of them may be interesting for using this concept, antagonistic toler tolerance, which will show this complexity of a situ situation. And uh, once more, I uh, stress that the situation is liquid and further monitoring is needed. So thank you so much for your attention. Allah, thank you very much for your such an empirically rich presentation. I enjoyed it very much. And now it's time for us to switch on some conclusive comments. And I would like to present you the commentator of this panel, Dr. Maciej Krzywosz. He's holding his PhD from the Jagiellonian University. He's uh, the assistant professor and head of laboratory of research and documentation of miraculous phenomena in Poland in the Institute of Sociology and Cognitive Science in the University of Białystok. 
In 2016, he published the book Cuda w Polsce Ludowe Studium, Przypadku Prywatnego Objawienia Maryjnego w Zabłudowie, Miracles in the Polish People's Republic, a case study of the private Marian apparition in Zabłudów. He runs courses in sociology of religion and religious studies. Please, Maciej, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, first, I would like to thank for the opportunity to take part in this interesting conference. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, also, thank for all presentation uh, for presenter for for the paper. Uh, I I think it's difficult to find common part of this presentation because uh, vernacular memory is totally different. Yes, we have totally different context: Ukraine, Poland, uh, Lisbon, uh, Macedonia. So I, I decided to speak a little about uh, separate text. Uh, mainly, I think it's, uh, I made some remarks or asked some questions, yes. As uh, I, I'm Paul, so the context of first presentation was uh, very important. Also, as I was, uh, um, Present. I'm working at the Institute of Sociology. It's the main problem for first text and also for all conference is the term of the post-secularism. Because as I know uh, from the so 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 sociologist perspective, uh, the, our society, I mean the Eastern European societies, are not post-secular. I know that it's a kind of fashion or maybe logic of our words, yes? Sometimes uh, we must use the bus words. And I think that the uh, post-secularism, post -secularism, I, I, I mean the, the using of the term by Jürgen Habermas, because uh, he introduced this term to the sociology of religion, is wrong in our context. It's my, uh, it's my opinion. Uh, why? Why uh, we, are the, we are not the post-secular uh, countries? The term, uh, term post-secularism uh, was emerged after the attack on the World Trade Center. Yes. And it was something new for some theories of social life that religion is, knowing, is not going to die. And it was the problem of Habermas. Habermas is the from Enlightenment tradition. He was the secularist. For him, for years, religion was nothing. And after the attack of the World Trade Center, he saw that religion is not going to, to die. And he, he thought that he must establish some theoretical uh, frame to find a place for religion in secularist world. Yes. The post-secularist societies is like the England societies, yes, when uh, religion back to public life, but the uh, level of religious city is still very low. The post-secular societies, the Quebec, yes, all, 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 all Western uh, uh, Europe. I think that we are not the post-secular societies. I understand, as I said, the logic of our um, scientific world and uh, fashion, yes. Uh, 20 years ago was uh, also the fashion, uh, the, the buzzword, the, the privatization of religion, which was coined by Thomas Luckmann, yes. Uh, everybody knows the uh, Berger and Luckmann uh, book, um, the social, uh, construction of reality, Lukman also uh, wrote a, a book, The Invisible Religion, yes? and in this book you can find the word privatization religion. And the privatization religion was only to the modern societies. It was strictly meaning. And after a few years uh, you can find uh, books or articles where, where the author write about the privatization religion of Papua New Guinea and uh, Polish peasants. Is Polish peasants, especially in the south of Poland, are post-secular peasants? So uh, it's the main uh, object 
from the point of this, uh, from the point of the guy who worked at the uh, Institute of the Sociology. I think that might be better for uh, describe describe or uh, say something about the Polish religious life is uh, different conception. Uh, um, it was mentioned yesterday at the presentation about the genocide in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. I mean the conception of lived religion. It's, I think it's better to, to, to the Polish context and especially to the Polish uh, religious because religion is, is still matter in Poland. Yes? And it's still uh, when it wasn't secular society. Of course, th th there were some so sociologists. For example, in Poland, it was the professor Paweł Czyńska who uh, in the 60s uh, do research on Polish village and she combined the level of tractors and the level of peasant who, who were atheist. It was on the beginning of the 60s. It, 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 no, no one, uh, no, nobody it continued. For example, the uh, professor Ciupak, yes, the father of um, Magdalena Środa, uh, who, who was the Marxist sociologist, I think that uh, he didn't believe in the end of religion. Yes. And I think it was uh, very similar in, the, in the Russia. Yes. For example, the problem of Visarion sects in, in Russia. It's the problem of the uh, post-secular society. It's a traditional Russian sect like uh, all believers, Skopci, Hwist, etc. Yes. So I think it's, it's uh, buzzwords uh, if uh, the term of the post-secularism. Maybe if I can uh, say something more about the first presentation, because I know the uh, people who also interested in Białystok in the memorize the genocide, uh, and uh, Dr. Jarzyńska mentioned the Habermas. In my mind uh, was idea the famous uh, opponent of Habermas in the USA, I mean the Richard Rorty, and his theory about the, of course, the relation uh, to religion, uh, um, Richard Rorty's relation to religion was, of course, uh, changing, but uh, also he, he coined the, the term idiosyncrasy, something very private, very strange, and I think that the people in Poland, like uh, the first uh, hero, uh, Zbawa, yes, and the people in Białystok, also, it's it some, some, some kind of idiosyncrasy. I think that the local community uh, is, uh, it's only the private thing, yes. It, it was the, my remarks to the uh, first uh, text. To the uh, text uh, second about the Macedonia, I, uh, I think that uh, the conception of uh, Daniel Hervé Leger, yes, about the religious memory, um, religious memory chain, it doesn't suit to the Macedonia. Yes. I don't know, but uh, what kind of, um, what kind of uh, crisis of modernity you have in the Macedonia? From your text, I think that you are, your, your nations in still in state of ascending. The problem of the Buneva is some kind of quarrel in the family of nationalists. Is Buneva 100 Macedonian or it's the 800 of Macedonian? So uh, also, I, I think that the, as I remember, the Daniel Vielager uh, wrote about the problem of young ecologists who moved from big cities to the province, to the countryside, and they were atheists, and, next to, and in the few years, these atheists were the religious, yes? It was some kind of new age. They uh, go to the countryside as uh, ecologists, and this small group was, after a few years, a religious group. And, and it was the problem, Daniel Hervé Leger, and it's the problem modern or postmodern countries, not the countries like, uh, I think, the... the, 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 the uh, the Macedonia. The, the, the problem is the problem quarrels in the nationalist family, uh, I think. Uh, 
And to the uh, third presentation, uh, all, of, uh, all of them was uh, interesting, this uh, also. I think that it was, uh, um, um, the presenter, uh, presenter showed the tension between, between two narratives, yes? narrative of trams and narrative of trauma. And uh, you uh, recall, Oh, Judith Butler and uh, his interpretation of Antigona, and I don't uh, think that interpretation of Antigona made by Judith Butler is uh, suited because it was uh, Antigona for Judith Butler was sex was of course uh, woman, but the gender of Antigona was a man because Antigona was uh, like, like hero, yes. But uh, I think that the. Antigona, which is the symbol of the uh, narrative of trauma, uh, you can use the uh, book um, written by Marta Niesbaum, The Fragile of Goodness. Yes, because Niesbaum, yes, The Fragile of Goodness, uh, about the Antigona. Uh, Marta Niesbaum is a feminist now, but uh, in this time when, uh, when she wrote this book, uh, he was a classical academic uh, scholar. And, uh, her, uh, of course, Martin Nesbaum uh, defend the Antigona, but it's not the feminist interpretation of Antigona. It's the classical uh, defend of Antigona against the Kran and against the Hegel, of course, because uh, Hegel was uh, for, uh, for for stay. And I and uh, for the last uh, presentation. Uh, I'm interested in what is below the surface. What is the what the Ukrainian people thinking about these symbols of Hasidic in the public sphere? Because you use the term in, uh, antag antagonic tolerance, etc. Maybe it's not political correct, but maybe some of them interpret the Jew. Jews poster symbols, the Hasidic symbols, as some kind of neo-colonialism or some kind of aggression for, for them. That's all for me, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maciej. And uh, for your quite discussive and perhaps triggering comments somehow, uh, perhaps the participants, the presenters of the panel would like to comment and uh, maybe someone would like to comment on uh, this definition that Eastern European societies are not post-secular or interchangeability of lived religion and post-secular, please. Uh, I would very much like to do so. <laughs> uh, well, I am not a sociologist. That's the first, first point and thank you in general for, for your comment and uh, I promise to think about it uh, more. Still, um, it's been 20 years, 20 years almost since Habermas coined the term and a lot has happened since then. And for me, the post-secularity firstly uh, occurred as a useful term when I was uh, dealing with uh, Joseph Miłosz, uh, who was kind of transnational global, global personality and as a part of Polish culture, of course, of course, he was not only uh, like the not only Polish history was the source of he, he, his secularization, right? So that's one of the the, the paths uh, I have been through, right? And as the culture is the thing I'm studying, researching, and what interests me more than the society as such. Well, the I think that. Speaking about post-secular culture can be justified uh, if we have such figures as Miłosz, that's the first point, and it's a part of Polish culture. But uh, for my own uh, surprise, uh, while researching uh, this um, very, well, very much more local than uh, the, the Miłosz's work, text of culture uh, as those who, w that I presented today. I also found uh, the same mechanism of like creating meaning uh, with the usage of uh, religion. And that's one of my thesis today and it's, I'm sure it can be questioned, but maybe some of you may find something interesting in this, that the uh, 
the the experience of the genocide may be the secularizing uh, factor, actually, for, for the culture and for the individuals uh, as creators of the culture and partic active participants of it. That's, I think, one of the things I, I was trying to say. And the other is that, well, still, uh, it's hard nowadays to... Um, to distinguish clearly between what's like local and what's global, and still, as Polish like uh, citizens, I, I mean, pretty all of them are participants of this global culture uh, by medias, uh, simply, and um, well, some uh, global processes is there. Uh, experience. Uh, that's just uh, one of the reasons why I think the mm, this post secularity can be useful, uh, post secular thought. And one uh, just uh, maybe last remark. Among the thinkers developing this term, uh, one of the important for me was John McClure, author of this. Uh, mm, a uh, book about the novel in post-secular age, so he's interpreting literature, but he just stated at the beginning that for him what is post-secular in those novels he's researching is the um, questioning the boundary between the sacred and secular, as simple as this, right? So this is what uh, we are discussing and, well, there are some thinkers that uh, define post-secular just uh, in this way, and that's why of the reason I do so. Thank okay, thank you, Karina. Anyone else would like to comment? Or we just yes. should turn on discussion? I'd be happy to, uh -huh. okay. to, to respond. Is this working? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay, uh, thank you very much for, um, for, for your comments and on the um, on the, um, the remark of the use of um, Judith Butler's Antigone and um, the suggestion to use Martha Nussbaum instead. Um, I know Martha Nussbaum uh, work as well and I'm, I'm very interested in it, though I'm more interested in, her, um, in what she has to write about ethics and Seneca and um, the, um, that, that approach of her. The, within the, the larger frame, the, um, the feminist approach is, um, is exactly an appro one of the approaches I am looking for. It is not a feminist uh, dissertation in, in, in feminist studies. Uh, it is what I'm looking for in the, um, in the dissertation because I'm working with um, anecdotal memory, uh, lots of the different stories, it's, and it is on the, on the edge, on the... Um, between memory and post-memory, so it is barely memory and already post-memory. And of course, women didn't write memoirs, they wrote less, um, and the memories have to be found uh, elsewhere in these traces, in these artworks, in, 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 in a different archive. So I'm the, the, the whole, the red thread through the dissertation is a constitution of, um, of a new archive. Uh, so every chapter is about the archive. It, uh, it's very based on the Deridian notion of, um, of the archive. So uh, I am interested, I'm very interested in, in Judith Butler, but I will, I will certainly look into this very, I mean, this will be a small part, the war memorial in the last chapter, and see if uh, in the end this makes sense and, or, or not. And so I'm, I'm grateful for the, um, for the warning that, um, that you gave me. Um, yes, and that, that would be it. Thank you. Anyone else? Allah? I would like to res respond to. Thank you, Dr. Grzegorz, for your comments. And uh, I'm sure that there is a lot uh, to dig in. And um, uh, speaking about what is below the surface, I'm sure that there is much to speak about, yeah, which, which is below. In 2014, when I conducted some qualitative interviews with women inhabitants, it was not like a real sociological survey. I, w I was just curious. I paid attention is that there was a kind of cultural trauma. So people are shocked or culture, or 
cultural shock. People are shocked, but people are curious at the same time. Right now, again, as a sociologist, I can't claim that uh, there is a big shift of attitudes, but um, I see that uh, the, um, some radicalizations of the mood is obvious, and right now I'm um, in the process of uh, um, preparing a big field survey uh, uh, on uh, on women uh, how um, um, to measure what it is uh, there, what kind of neo-colonialism discourse is uh, inside, what people mean by you know taking the space or taking something else in the town. So I can't say at the moment. What is, the, what is there, but I'm sure that there is many, many, many problems and conflicts and obstacles there. So uh, let's wait just a little bit more and yeah, I can speak about that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you everybody. And now we are finally turning on to discussion and general questions. I think we will pick up questions together and then you will respond. Is it okay? Good. So. Thank you very much. My first question is to Karina. Uh, uh, you were talking, you mentioned the Judeo-Christian eclectic bricolage, or well, all, all this kind of stuff. What, what do you mean by Judeo-Christian? What, what are the uh, 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 particular, uh, particular objects or particular uh, signs of, of, of this one? And also, I was, I was thinking about uh, remembering what uh, the rabbi was talking about the other day. Um, uh, uh, if, if we make a sort of chron chronological diagram or just counting the cases, uh, uh, how many of them are joint initiatives and, how, and, and what is the share of separate independent in initiative from, from Catholic and Jewish sites, for, for example? So, and, and, if, uh, and chronologically, what, are, uh, what, what, what is the trend and when, when it started? And when, how, how, how has it developed? It's just an idea of making this kind of, you know, uh, diagram to see what, how, uh, uh, how, how these things are interacting. And the uh, other question is to Alla. Yes, Alla. Um, <coughs> I remember this film by Krzysztof Kop Kop Kopczynski, the the book, the D book. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's great, and I'm. I show it to, to my students, and uh, actually, uh, uh, it shows that uh, uh, this this monument of to, uh, this, this new monument to Van Gutna and uh, Maxim Zalizniak. Zalizniak, yeah. So, uh, but you were talking about the offi official official memory. Uh, so, what do you mean by official official memory? This you use this for the official memory of the Rabbi Nachman and all the competition, as you said, between different groups of Hasidim but, uh, or, uh, or, or other Jews. Uh, but uh, is, it, is it really competition? Uh, com and, and you also speak of official uh, narrative, uh, official memory by the local authorities who created this monument to the Ukrainians who allegedly killed the Jews in the 18th century. So it's, it's another official narrative. So what, uh, just, just using the, this, this term, the, uh, the, uh, this hierarchy of uh, official narratives and competition, what kind of competition. And one uh, uh, final uh, note, uh, which is very important in Uman, as far as I understand, is that there is no local Jews. So all the, Jew, all, all the Jew, uh, Jews who come to Rosh Hashanah and, and, and all, all these kind of uh, mm -hmm. commemorations are coming from Israel or United States mostly or elsewhere. Is it, is it right? So it changes completely the, uh, the landscape, so the, uh, the perception of, of, of the other within uh, the local community. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a question for, for now. <coughs> is, uh, in this new narrative uh, by uh, Depemene in the last 10-15 uh, uh, years and uh, Skopje 2014, there are a number of historical instances and heroes and, and monuments uh, that are um, claimed by both Bulgaria and Macedonia. So my question is uh, whether uh, uh, Bunova, uh, Buneva, 
is uh, just one, one more in, in the line of heroes contested between the two sides, or is, is it something different in her case that illustrates some, 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 some new controversy or some new trend? And maybe additional to that, um, uh, Vemero, old Vemero, nationalist Vemero, was, um, had quite controversial uh, relationship to the first Yugoslavia, well illustrated, of course, by the uh, um, assassination of King Alexander. Um, is this reflected uh, equally in, in this new narrative uh, of the Vemero de Pemene in, in the country, or is it they have revisited in a more positive way that, that, that historical period? Thank you. I'm sorry, I just have to refer to this issue of post secularity because I can agree with uh, uh, Professor Mar Mar Magic Shivos uh, that uh, maybe uh, it is discussable whether yes. Polish society is post secular. However, as I read uh, Habermas book Between Naturalism and Religion, I think that uh, his definition of the post-secular society in fact may be applicable to the situation described by Karina. Uh, as he said, that post-secular society is referred to a situation in which society is conscious that both sides, the uh, secular part of the uh, people who are uh, uh, secular, who are identified with secular idiom and religious uh, citizens need uh, mutual recognition and they have to become more reflexive toward each other and he names this process of complementary learning from, from one another. And there is also a definition of Christina Stöckel and Massimo Rossati of the uh, post-secular society. I don't know whether you are uh, familiar with uh, this uh, and uh, because the, uh, you, you argued that the privatization is only maybe the reason it is not applicable, but in fact, uh, in fact, uh, Karina uh, described how she understands post-secularity. But uh, I don't know whether it is uh, possible, and I can address a question also to uh, Professor Maciej Krzywosz, but I, I, uh, I don't feel like I understood why it is not applicable to Polish society, according to you. Uh, because I have to, uh, I agree that we have to be very careful with every uh, category. Yes, we, we have to not to use it unreflexively because it is then not worthy, it is worthy nothing. But um, I think we should be also, uh, uh, we should also try to be more careful when to define this category, even if we criticize if somebody is using it wrongly. So this consciousness is, according to me, the most uh, important. And also, uh, uh, according to Kristina Stegel and Massimo Rosati, also reflexivity is one of the, uh, of the, um, of the phenomena which is, which is defining post-secular society and coexistence in the same sphere of public life of religious and uh, secular uh, um, worldviews. And I think that in nowadays Poland, we really have problems with this coexistence. Uh, the situation is very dynamic, and maybe we, in fact, may apply this term. I think it's very, it is very discussable. Thank you. So, uh, any more questions? We have actually time for one more question or a comment. Please. Um, uh, thank you very much for an uh, interesting presentation. And Vera, the first question to you. Uh, is this charge in Lisbon still exist and an important place for the German diaspora? Or it's, uh, uh, now it's less important or maybe even doesn't play the role? And uh, I'll add the question to you about uh, the, the feeling. It's not, a, not, it's not correct to say the feeling. Uh, as I correctly understand, uh, for the community, uh, this uh, the, this movement with uh, these uh, memorials, it's uh, um, react as a positive side, or they are afraid and not understand what's going on. So, what is the feeling? What is the reaction of the people who are living in this place? Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm afraid that we should go to the answers because we have lack of time. No more questions. So please, turn to answer it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, so
I'll be quite brief, but we can talk later, I hope. About the Judeo-Christian commemorative language, um, mm, well, I used the, this hyphen, uh, I used hyphen to, to make this expression because I perceive uh, Saint of Zebawa as a mediator, as someone who places himself in this uh, in-between place um, position and try to, uh, as neither Jew or Christian actually, as his, uh, his like religious identity is neither, but someone who has some cultural uh, competence to, to learn uh, and to mediate. So he learned Judaism as he can and he translates it maybe a bit to his Christian cohabitants. And during this process, he uh, innovatively creates new um, symbols and expressions and, and such. And I, I gave the examples, I think, uh, well, the, the most obvious one maybe, and the one that, where some of them was just kind of Jewish symbols, but wrongly, uh, but, uh, but uh, mm, like cre rep represented in a wrong way, so there is non-Christian element actually in this. Maybe only the fact that um, they are made to be understood by Christians, but maybe or they are signs of some uh, strangeness to Jewish culture. So yeah, maybe it's not a very good example, but well, I will argue that this mm, this cemetery symbol I just showed you are actually a, mm, is actually a, um, an object that appropriates both uh, religious mm, traditional imaginaries as there mm, there are mats, hmm. there are matsevas the I'm thinking if if there is something strictly Christian, if there are crosses. I think this is, if I understood well your question, uh, you, I, I got your point. Maybe I over, I have to work on this a, a bit more. Mm, but still this mediation was very important for me and uh, well, it's work in progress. So briefly about this commemorating um, Jewish the genocide sites, uh, the Jewish, the rabbinic commission for cemeteries in Poland was established in 2002. I just checked it, and actually, it uh, it very much rhymes with, with what we observe as a research team. That this is a very interest, important moment of um, intensification of the work on the Jewish memory, of course, because of the Gross book, probably. Um, but well, the okay. Well, uh, the cases we research mostly uh, begins with the Polish initiative, like the Jewish uh, institution got the uh, receives a letter from the site from for, from someone who lives there. Uh, please do something with the site, we have something like this, we cannot deal with it, but we remember, so please come and help us to deal with it, something like this. So it's mostly the case. But this is what we, uh, it's interesting for us, so maybe there are some other cases that we don't know about. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your questions. I will try to answer your questions first. So the first question was about official memory, what I mean by that. I mean, I mean it in a very maybe simplistic way, but I mean that um, if something is officially approved by documents, by president or by supreme council or by local council, it's, of, it's 
official, but, but the boundary is very tentative. So as we could see, the, the place of prayer of the Hasidim in 1993, we, we should say it was a kind of vernacular memory when it was officially uh, approved by the president in, in 1994, it became a kind of official memory. So I would say it's an interplay, but of course I would rely on the official docu documents official status, sta sta statuses. In this regard, renaming of the street official is official memory. If people just come and say something, it's like, how to say, it's a, it's a different kind. And then um, when we speak about um, local Jews, so it's very interesting concept, which I'm thinking about for a, for a long time. What, what is local and who is local? Because, for instance, when I digged into the archives, and the last year which I digged up to this moment, it, it was 2013, it's also a partial reply to your question, 75% of all accommodation near the street and grave was bought by uh, foreigners, mostly of Israeli origin. So most of those flats are bought, but no one lives there. But some people started to live there. And most of them also have a different uh, um, national identity. Yeah? But there are some people also who choose their uh, citizenship to Ukrainian citizenship. And when you see, for instance, and you could also find some interviews now by uh, people who say, we represent the Hasidic community and we live in Ukraine and we, in, and we are here for two years, for three years, so who are they? So it's a very interesting question. Who is the local now? Also, we could speak about this internal migration in Ukraine caused by, as we know, war. Uh, not so big in Uman, yes, but of course it's also kind of visible. So there are people who come. So who is local? And the, uh, the fact that local memory is being shaped and reshaped and changed, it's, it's real, yes. But what is local now? And who can be re re regarded local? Should we um, also rely on some documents, like a person who lived for some part, who knows the language, who knows this, who knows or should we use some other frames for this now? So it's, a, it's an interesting question. And also there is a local Jewish community, small community as far as I know, which is not Hasidic community, but it's almost invisible on the, in the context of all this. Yeah? So as we say, some Hasidic people live there, and who are, who are, who are they? Some of them can say that we are, uh, okay, we are, we, are, we are Jews, but we live in Ukraine, and uh, we are here just to, to do something. So it's also a very complicated question. About the film The Book, I also watched it, and I spoke with Krzysztof Kopczynski about this film. It's a very interesting documentary film, which I'm sure is necessary to watch if you're interested in this topic. And of course, it's about, uh, how to say, polarization. So when you see a Ukrainian, you could see a very poor, uh, homeless, like, or a person who doesn't have a job or home, which is not true, I mean, for uh, all people, yeah? So, the, but this, this is a person who is described in the film. Or when you see a Hasid, you could see a very religious, very, you know, pious person, uh, who is obviously like a typical person, but there are different kinds of pilgrims who come over there. So, of course, uh, this film is interesting and important, and we should take into account that the, pro the process is very liquid, so, and there is much more packed, um, packed in. And also, as I, sp as, uh, as I said already, many flats have been bought already, yeah? I, and I assume that this, the situation has even changed since 2013. It's also about your comment. So, and also you saw the advertisement, my, my, uh, my home is Uman, yeah? so which is also about building new buildings, also for some foreigners, obviously. And, and of course, uh, um, I saw some documents by the locals who lived in that street uh, in 2000, 2010, and most of those documents I found in the archives, they were complaints. Complaints, 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 but it's obvious. Yeah? So more and more foreigners come and they just... Uh, up to this moment, I would say that um, the situation, I think, is much more complicated because the bigger part of the town is not covered by the pilgrims. So we, we speak a lot about that, but the pilgrimage takes part in a relatively limited area. It's, coming, it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's a, a, a relatively small area. So I think it's a process which needs, again, to be uh, researched and surveyed. So that's... Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, the church still still exists and it's active. It still depends uh, 
from from partly from the German state, um, like uh, the churches do in in, in Germany. Um, it is quite important, and it has it has uh, of course a religious and denominational importance. The denominational importance is um, big in Portugal. Uh, remaining an at least officially uh, Catholic country and as um, there had been uh, people who were not Catholics were discriminated against until the 70s uh, officially then the law changed but until this changes um, there it's, it takes generations uh, socially it takes generations because of course you didn't have Protestants in the elites and until you have a Portuguese Protestant in uh, in an elite that or any other uh, non-Catholic uh, religion, th that will take some time. It is culturally important too because it's so linked to the language, and, but that is too big to, to, to dwell upon that, but we, I'll gladly um, exchange some ideas in, during the, the intermission. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the questions, very good questions indeed. Uh, I will try to be as brief as possible, namely, uh, speaking about Skopje 2014, uh, when one look at the, the historical narrative of the project, the working definition of mine is a historical, um, a historical amalgamation, which is touching upon different historical phases, uh, and on the other hand, it's clearly pre presenting a very party-centered, top-down, univocal narrative. And uh, I guess you're referring to the, the medieval Tsar, Tsar of Samuel. He, he, he did caused uh, reactions, even uh, the Bulgarians established a monument in the very city center of Sofia after it was established in, in, in Skopje. But what I find interesting here is the uh, very interpretation of the interwar Vomero uh, as within uh, the, the Skopje 2014 narrative. And what I tried to try to argue is that uh, the, the, the official narrative, uh, the official party narrative as such is, is some sort of uh, reconciliation of the leftist and the rightist uh, streams within the, within the revolutionary organization from the interwar period, uh, which is manifested not only by the symbolic somehow whitewashing of Bunawa as such, but also as a monument of, of Alexandrov uh, in, the cent in, the, in the very city center of Skopje as well, the leader of the, of the interwar Vomero. And uh, uh, to, to a certain extent, somehow also positioning all the other figures affiliated with, with Alexandrov in the new novel Museum of the Macedonian Struggle. What is very interesting is that the people who were openly uh, ad, uh, advocating for, for certain uh, fascist, let's say, ideology from the interwar period are, are, are not included in the, in the nar narration as such. On the other hand, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the Vlado Chernozemsky, namely the chauffeur, the, the, assassination, the assassinator of the, of the uh, Yugoslav uh, king. Yes, there was a, 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 a certain set of commemorations uh, of Vlado Chernozemsky. It was in his native town of Stip, in the eastern part of Macedonia, and one can even read the commemorations of Chernozemsky as some sort of, let's say, introduction or the pretext to the, to the Bunavas' uh, commemorations. Uh, in this regards, uh, maybe the main argument here is that uh, the very location of the of the of the commemorative activities is is giving more visibility to the to the commemorative uh, parade in Skopje rather than in Stip, which is even in the periphery of the of the very peripheral city. So I guess we can we can trace some sort of logic here. Uh, as far as I uh, no, there are no uh, commemorations of Chernozemsky in the last 10 years. So practically, I guess the whole stream just just moved to Skopje uh, within the commemorative uh, activities regarding Mara Bunela's case. So if this answers your question. So thank you all uh, for this inspiring panel and for the discussion. I'm afraid I have to announce coffee break. Uh, because we all deserved it, and we can just uh, continue our discussions and talks there. Thank you very much.